and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. My guest in episode 34 is Andrew Stafford. In 2004, UQP published his landmark book named Pig City, From the Saints to Savage Garden, which covered three decades of Queensland's musical and political history. Three years later, the book was followed by an event of the same name, staged by Queensland Music Festival and featuring a headline performance by the original lineup of Brisbane punk rock band The Saints, who had not played together in almost 30 years. Sometimes authors live to see their book made into a film. It is much rarer that a book is made into a music festival with their heroes headlining, and Andrew Stafford can count himself among the lucky few in the latter category. Reviewing the Pig City Festival in 2007 was one of my first assignments as a fledgling music journalist for the website Faster Louder, and in the years since, Andrew and I have become colleagues and friends. Having spent 14 years driving a cab while writing about music, sport, and the environment, Andrew is a full-time freelance journalist who now writes about these matters for a range of outlets, including The Guardian, The Saturday Paper, and The Sydney Morning Herald. In late September... I visited his home in the Brisbane suburb of St. Lucia to record a conversation which touches on the skill set required for his long-standing role as Queensland AFL correspondent for the Age newspaper, how an early interest in birdwatching introduced him to an enduring passion for punk rock, how he got started writing about music for Brisbane Street Press and Rolling Stone magazine, how his depression has affected his productivity throughout his career how he first hatched the idea for Pig City and spent three years writing it while driving taxis, and how he looks back on a mental health crisis in early 2016 that led to national media coverage in the wake of his sudden disappearance. Introducing Andrew Stafford, author and freelance journalist. Stafford, welcome. Nice to be here. At, at your home, yes. I, I imagine it is nice to be here. <laughs> it's always nice to be home. Yeah. Let's start with the here and now, because you and I are both freelance journalists, and funnily enough, we're both in the same position, which is we're kind of shaking the trees, looking for work. Um, we're broke. Yeah. How does, how does that work for you? What, what do you do in this situation? Well, in some ways, uh, it's... I'm in new territory in a sense. I drove a cab for many, many years, 14 years, between late 2000, year 2000, and uh, the middle of 2015. And uh, and I gave that up um, for reasons which, for which we may return to later, if you wish. And was able to fully recommit myself to writing from that point on. So I've only just been back as a full-time freelancer for a bit over 12 months. And during the winter months, I'm employed by The Age as uh, as their AFL correspondent in Brisbane. So I follow around the Brisbane Lions and the Gold Coast Suns. But I'm on a uh, retainer during that time and... Uh, you know the end of the season of course is here and uh, my retainers run out so um, I'm now in the position of pretty much living off my wits with nothing coming in next week as far as I'm aware at this point uh, which is a scary position to be in Um, you know there are going to be weeks I accept this where sometimes the rent might get paid on credit and other weeks where you know, I might get the equivalent of two or three weeks pay at once. It's the way this business works, I guess. And, uh, you know, I've been kind of woefully under underprepared for it, even though I could see it coming all along, a little bit like a rabbit in the headlights. Hmm. It's not like I've saved any money for, for this very moment. I'm pretty good at spending it. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a reckoning and it's a challenge. And, uh, you know, I must, I, I'm feeling in pretty good shape. I'm feeling like it's a challenge that I hope is going to help get the best out of me at this moment. Yeah, that's a good attitude to have. Uh, just concentrate on the AFL stuff for a second. It's it's Thursday, the Grand Finals on Saturday, two days' time. Yeah, right. Does that mean that after Saturday, 
you're done for the year in terms of AFL writing? You don't have any... Not entirely, because uh, because I cover the Brisbane Lions and because they've had such a, a traumatic year, they've kind of been, from a freelance point of view, really they've been the gift that keeps on giving. You know, they've still got to appoint a coach. Well, know? do you want to briefly touch on that? I'm not an AFL fan myself, and perhaps our listeners aren't. Um, give a capsule kind of overview of the Brisbane Lions in 2016. Well, the Brisbane Lions have... Uh, had a very difficult year and you know they've actually had a very difficult decade. I've been doing this job for the age for 11 years and in that time I've seen just the one final. Um, the the Lions have been a, a, a poorly administrated and poorly run club for uh, over a decade and they've recruited badly and um, and very little has gone, nothing really has gone right for them this year. Um, it's culminated in them sacking their coach. There's speculation about whether the captain might be traded, which is you know, a rarity in, in AFL. Um, and uh, from my point of view as a freelancer, that's, that's certainly given me plenty to write about. And uh, you know, that, that could extend out a, a couple of weeks yet because the coach is still yet to be appointed. So when that happens, I will, I will have something to write about. I'm guessing that as an age football writer, you're near the top of the tree in terms of um, publications that people within that field will want to talk to. So do you have like a, a pretty decent list of contacts that you can tap around the Lions and the Suns in uh, particular? It's, you know, I'd have to say probably not, or at least not as much as you might think. And that's because really I was not hired as a newsbreaker. Mm. I was hired for my feature writing and just pure writing ability rather than necessarily my ability to break news. Um, as you know, the last few years have unfolded with the Lions, I've actually had to get better at that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been a, a big challenge and... Uh, something that I'm only just feel like I'm starting after all of this time, I'm only just starting to get my head around what it takes to do it. What, what is the difference between a feature article and a, a straight sports news story? Is it kind of dropping a lot of the colour and is getting to the facts? Just getting to the getting to the meat of the matter. But the, the age is the age is interesting and a pleasure to work for in that it does give you a little bit more room to move creatively. You know, Fairfax gives you more room to move creatively than uh, perhaps other publications would. So, you know, there is still room to to put a little bit of colour into, into some pieces, at least to reflect the gravity of the circumstances. So, for example, covering uh, most recently Justin Lepich's or the, the press conference announcing that uh, the former coach Justin Lepich had been axed. You know, that there was a fair bit of gravity and drama in that situation and it was uh, as important to try to bring that out in the story as it was just simply to deliver the news. It's funny to hear you talk about this because I don't follow AFL, as I said earlier, and um, as far as I could tell, you don't seem to share a lot of your AFL articles on social media. Um, no, I don't, and, and that's... Purely, I, I suppose, a reflection of the fact that my circle of friends like you are, well, I mean, not so much, not just a, not just not AFL fans, but not sports fans in general. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think they really want to go there. In fact, they tell me they don't want to go there. So it's not that I'm not proud of uh, that work or don't enjoy that work, because I do very much, but um, I tend not to kind of push it down the throats of my friends in the, in the same way that I share with them the other work which I think that you know that they are actually more interested in mm -hmm. um, even on Twitter to be honest I don't pump up my AFL work perhaps as much as I should it's a matter of not crossing the streams um, it's probably more just an older reflection of the fact that Melbourne and Brisbane are very different cultures and of course I was born in Melbourne and grew up there until I was 15 uh, at which point my parents upped and moved here. Uh, Melbourne is a very different place in that it is perfectly acceptable and indeed accepted to be passionate about the arts and sport at the same time. In fact, in Melbourne, AFL is practically an extension of theatre, hmm. you know. It is every rock star, every artist has a team that they go for. 
I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, there will always be exceptions, but mm -hmm. it is very much inculcated in the culture there to have an AFL team, and that's the culture that I grew out of. Mm -hmm. When I came to Brisbane, there was much less overlap in those streams, as you put it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are sport, you know, you're into sports or you're into the arts, and not both, typically, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. That was very strange. Right? I don't see why there's not room to enjoy both pastimes. Indeed, and I do enjoy both pastimes, just not Aussie rules. <laughs> um, do you have a like a dedicated core of Andrew Stafford AFL writing followers, people who only know you as an AFL oh, writer? On, on Twitter, yes, I, I guess there is there are there are some, but I think that even then, that's probably a probably a minority of my readership you know maybe maybe less than a quarter um i tend to tweet a lot more about well more more about politics than anything else really um and then after that it would probably be music uh wildlife matters um natural history which is a you know very keen interest of mine and has been since i was a boy mm. um and uh and then, and then football, you know, I mean, I, I kind of almost, my, my employers would probably hate to say this, but almost treat it like an afterthought on social media. <laughs> right. Well, so footy season's almost over, perhaps sparring a few Brisbane Lions ongoing developments. Yes. What, what kinds of, of those topic areas are you pitching uh, new stories in at the moment? Okay. Well, you know, as I said before, I don't have cab driving to fall back on. I don't have another gig at this stage. Um, I think I've got some editing work lined up uh, starting in about a, a month's time and that will help keep the wolf from the door since we're talking about how to make a living mm. um, and that really can't come soon enough. But I'm, but I'm realising uh, or have realised in the course of the last year that, you know, this is a, you know, I, I get a, I'm getting a surprising amount of music journalism work and the major newspapers uh, ha have mostly gotten rid of their music writers they've been either made redundant or they've left and very f you know none of them have been replaced so really we're down now to Ian Shedden at the Australian Bernard Zool at the Sydney Morning Herald and Am I missing anyone? Kathy McCabe, maybe? National? Yeah, possibly. Mikey Cahill? Yeah, maybe Cameron Allen. There's very few. Yeah. And, and I don't write for News Limited, um, of which perhaps more later. But, um, you know, the point is that there are not many music writers or people that have written about music that have been around as long as I have that have stuck at it and it's something that I've returned to and found that there are actually opportunities there mm. and I'm getting quite a bit of work and you know coming into the summer festival season it's like oh well actually you know there's going to be work that I can pick up around that and it's easier than perhaps I thought mm. it's just really a matter of hitting up the contacts and the publicists and saying I'm keen uh, so, for example, next week, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll be talking to Suzanne Vega, of whom I, I'm a huge fan. Mm -hmm. I don't usually get rattled talking to uh, people, but I'll have to suppress my inner fanboy for this one in a way that I haven't since I spoke to PJ Harvey when I was a, a young pup reporter, perhaps, <laughs> you know, 20 years ago, and I, I wrote, I wrote uh, because I was determined to print absolutely everything that she uh, said, I you know spread out, spread out the story across two issues in in the local street paper of absolute gibberish. <laughs> well, maybe let's go back there then. What got the you... gibberish was mine, by the way, not Polly's. Sure. What got you into wanting to be the kind of person who makes a living from putting pen to page? Well, that in itself is a bit of a winding tale. When I was a boy, I was quite the outsider, which I still feel like, particularly here in Brisbane. And 
And I gravitated to two things as a boy very quickly. I developed an interest in birds, and I've been a birder my whole life. That's a very, very important part of who I am. And when I was growing up, all I really wanted to do, to be honest, was to go to university and study zoology so I could spend my life in the field. Hmm. And that's not how it worked out because I really, you know, I had a, a gift and a flair for words from a, for also from a very young age and I had a real block about numbers. Hmm. So I couldn't do maths or science really to save my life. Even biology I struggled in, <laughs> let alone uh, chemistry or anything else. So eventually, you know, I took the path of least resistance and ended up, you know, going through all of the humanities in school, doing really well and being accepted into the University of Queensland to do arts law. Now, I lasted with the law degree part for about six months and worked out that that really wasn't for me and then sort of was a bit, I drifted for a bit. It took me a while to work out what my path was. The second thing that I gravitated towards when I was when I was young was music, um, and by my early teens, I was introduced by other bird watchers actually to punk. <laughs> funnily enough, you know, I I remember being on this trip to. You know, some, somewhere in the wilds of the Mallee in Victoria and being introduced to the Dead Kennedys and the Sex Pistols and Midnight Oil. And that changed my life, really on the spot. And Midnight Oil was really the first great love for me, which was about as punk rock as things got growing up out in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne at that time. And they were, um, as I've said, on numerous occasions before a political awakening as well as a musical awakening and it started to give me a sense of self I suppose um, and helped con helped confirm I guess that sort of slight outsider status that I developed I was a really like we're getting into psychological territory now but I was a little kid I was really small, All right. you know, tiny, skinny. Took years for the growth spurt to come, and I got bullied quite yep. a lot when I was in school. Youngest brother? Uh, no, no. I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm actually the elder brother of two. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, music go. You know, as as a as a young kid growing up in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne and kind of getting pushed around a bit you know music gave me something to grab onto mm. and uh so that, where uh, was that, I? That in, this... interest in in um words did that translate to, to writing were you writing stories or right exactly yeah sorry so we were going back to going back to how this leads back into writing but um at some point after quitting the law degree you know by that by that stage i was um you know quite active on the music scene in Brisbane. I was going to see local shows a lot. What year are we talking? Oh, about? we're talking in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, and starting to consume rock press. And it occurred to me that that was something that I could do. It, it allowed me to fuse my interests in words with music. And unfortunately, you know, I had not picked up an instrument at school. Um, my mother's attempts to, you know, get me to play piano notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. um, but this felt like something that I could do. I could make a contribution to music in some, you know, in a different way. What was the uh, the timeline roughly between first seeing street press here in Brisbane and deciding, hang on, maybe I could give this a go? Well, it probably actually was just reading Rolling Stone magazine, to be honest. All right. Um, and... Uh, I'm not sure about the timeline, but it, I guess it would have been it would have been a couple of years. And a friend of mine uh, was working for Time Off at that point, and he invited me along to a gig and invited me to review it. Mm -hmm. It was 
an up and coming UMI who were about to release their first album um, with supporting the Beasts of Bourbon who were at their dangerous peak at that time um, and uh, that was it Wow, that's a good good uh, intro for a friend It wasn't bad Yeah <laughs> How do you think I started writing that? for the street press straight away Did you nail it that first time or were you kind of just making it up as you went along for a little while mm. I don't know if I nailed it but I obviously had something going there um, you know they invited me back mm-hmm. and it felt like uh, calling's too strong a word but I dived into it yeah yeah. I, I, I was like this is this is it this is what I'm going to do and so was that just gig reviews to start with mm-hmm. or did you go into other gig friends? reviews and uh, record reviews and, and then interviews you know which was kind of nerve wracking Mm. But, uh, you know, I managed to get past that and away I went. And, um, and you know, I've been doing music writing in one form or another on and off ever since. And it's something that in the last 12 months I've really returned to full force, even doing record reviews, which I hadn't done for many years, doing reviews for The Guardian now. And uh, it's something that I find that I still really enjoy. Um, I might not have enjoyed it so much if I hadn't at some point been able to break out of the music writing box because uh, I felt very trapped within that cul-de-sac for a while. And having a lot of different interests, it was very important to me to try to establish myself as someone who could commentate on areas other than just music. And uh, uh, now, though, I can go back to it and find that as I said before, there are opportunities there, which is great. I get the chance to talk to some people who I really admire, which is which is cool. Mm. Um, it's a very soft kind of journalism, but you know there are worse ways to to earn a few coins. <laughs> Indeed, talk me through the mechanics of interviewing in the nineties. What what kind of equipment did you have, and how did you turn it into a story? Mm. In the nineties, well, those days, you know, we were reliant on. You know, usually a Sony Walkman got the job done or, you know, <laughs> anything else that housed a cassette. And, in fact, I stuck with that technology for far, far, far longer than I needed to. I'm, I think uh, I think you're aware that I'm typically not what you would call an early adopter <laughs> of technology. It mm-hmm. takes a while for me to switch uh, for, from the tried and true. And I stuck with the Sony Walkman for a very long time. Did all of the interviews for Pig City on that Sony Walkman. Mm. So an external mic plugged into some part of the Walkman? Uh, yeah, you could you could do that. Um, generally, you'd have things on speakerphone and you'd just plonk the Walkman next to it. Oh. Or um, or if you, were, if you didn't have speakerphone, you'd have um, a cord that would attach from the Walkman to the, to the back of the headset. Mm. And uh, you'd use that. And then you'd have to transcribe... The and then you then you transcribe it up and yep in the same way as you do now mm. you'd just be hitting the rewind button <laughs> and then playing it back until it was done well we'll get to pick it's not that different we'll get to pick city obviously but um yeah those those first few years of your writing career um what were they like and how did how did your understanding of this world maybe changed as you went along because you were started at the very bottom of the mm. pile as like a, a junior writer yeah and perhaps you moved up through the ranks at time off and elsewhere yeah i pretty quickly started getting work at rolling stone kathy bale a wonderful editor who brought on many many young writers in the course of her career kind of gave me a start and got me in front of a national audience she invited you yeah. Wow. Uh, I think I pitched a story to her actually, and she made it known to me that she'd noticed my stuff. Would that have been? And that, and that there were opportunities for me. A phone call or a letter in those days? Uh, I think it was a combination of both. I think there was a letter and then there was a phone call. This was a couple of years pre email. Yeah. That would have been exciting to get a response from it, Rolling Stone. It was, yeah, hugely exciting. Um, I mean, we're, st- we're talking about the Australian arm of the magazine, of course, not the American arm. But look, Australian Rolling Stone in the early 
mid nineties was was a pretty pretty good magazine. Kathy was a fantastic editor, uh, and you know there were there were regrettable aspects of it, of course, like their uh, addiction to putting scantily clad movie stars on the on the cover. But um, it was a pretty serious music magazine and, and had some pretty good coverage of national affairs. I, you know, a lot of people hated it, but I thought it was great when uh, Kathy put Paul Keating on the cover and, you know, there were sh- uh, and interviewed him along with Linda Javen and uh, one other person. I cannot remember who now. It was Kathy and Linda Javen and one other. And it was irreverent and cheeky and... Uh, and serious at the same time. Mm. And I was pretty serious, you know. I was as interested in my politics as I was interested in music as I still maintained an interest in wildlife. Mm. And all of that was very appealing. But I had a big disadvantage in that I hadn't gone through, you know, I was going through university at this stage, or at least, you know, I was winding it up, and I'd completed my arts degree in communications. I didn't do journalism which has been, in the longer term, both, I think, to my advantage and to my detriment. Hmm. One of the ways in which it was to my detriment was that I didn't make the connections. There were some basic skills that I didn't learn all the way, like how to break news, which is why I'm still <laughs> picking that up now. Yeah. Um, but uh, the greater problem was that I didn't get introduced to the... I didn't make the connections. And so I was very much sort of sidling in the the back door of journalism by sort of going in the kind of popular culture um, path Mm. uh, and doing street press rather than sort of, you know, at that stage I probably could have gone into the Courier Mail if I'd wanted to at that that time. Yeah, I could have. I probably could have done that uh, or maybe even through the ABC. Mm. Uh, And I didn't do that. I didn't know anybody. And so a couple of years, after a few years of street press and freelancing for Rolling Stone, I ended up down in Sydney working for studio magazines, which published a whole series of art, photography, highbrow, nudie titles, like Black and White, uh, Blue, which was a gay title, gay and lesbian title, um... Studio for Men, which was a metrosexual fashion magazine before metrosexual was a word or a thing. Um, there was a wedding title and a children's fashion title, you know, for the well healed in Sydney. Right. And. What was your role? I was a copy editor there and, uh, and then features editor, I think. And from there, I moved on to Australian Geographic, which was an awful experience, and I was only there for six months. And I'd been at studio for, you know, a bit over 18, I think. Mm. What I didn't realise when I made that move to Sydney was that because I didn't know anybody, these were the jobs that appeared in the paper, you see. And I didn't know that the jobs that were advertised in the paper in journalism were basically the jobs no other journalists really wanted. Because... They were the places that were poor, that were known to be poorly managed, that had high levels of staff turnover, where they, that were poorly paid, where people were unhappy. I didn't know anybody. Mm. When I arrived in Sydney, I knew nobody, you know, one or two people at most, and I certainly didn't know them well enough to call them friends. Um, and... Uh, so I had a regrettable working experience in Sydney. And did that, you move to Sydney for that studio magazine I worked, job? I did, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that was a big call to make. Yeah. And of course I felt like, you know, I'd landed in the big city from Brisbane. And this is the thing about Brisbane. Brisbane kind of pushes you away and then ultimately seems to draw people back as well. And that's, yeah. that's what happened to me. But I also started to, you know, have some big battles with the black dog around around that time, particularly towards the end of that stint in Sydney, and I kind of came home to Brisbane with my tail between my legs. 
to continue the dog analogy, yes. Mm, um, yes. So, and I needed a reason to be back in Brisbane, so that's where Pig City comes in. Aha, uh-huh, aha. Uh-huh. Well, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, so you were working full-time for Studio Magazine. Does that mean that you stopped freelancing for Rolling Stone at that time? I actually... Um, I stopped for a while, but then I was able to continue working under another name, which was just ridiculous. I mean, we were so poorly paid at Studio that that uh, stopping us from, you know, the management stopping staffers from freelancing was frankly abhorrent. But uh, I, I guess Rolling Stone was seen as a competitor. I couldn't really see how it, how it was realistically, <laughs> but... So you had a pseudonym? I, uh, I was writing under the, under the name Andrew David, which is kind of pretty shitty, but you know, <laughs> David's my middle name. Um, <laughs> And I couldn't think of anything better, which was <laughs> an appalling lapse of creativity on my part. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was... Look, I mean, we were paid, I think, $27,000. For the full-time copy editor gig? Yep. Yeah. Instead, the, the secretary was getting paid more, which I... I, I and I believe it's, it was ever thus, you know, the, the PAs and the secretaries are always paid more than the... Hmm than the people that are actually uh, creating the copy that goes around the ads. So you had 18 months, roughly, with um, those skin mags. Um, yep. what, what was your daily task? What, what kind of copy were you dealing with? Was it easy to read and interesting work, or were you having to deal with terribly written often, faff? Often terribly written, and that was a huge eye-opener to me, actually. I started mm. to think maybe my own work wasn't that bad after all. Mm. Well, I didn't think it was bad, but... Um, I was actually astonished by uh, by some of the stuff that was crossing our desk and that we were basically trying to smash into shape and and uh, or rewriting in in large you know more often than not rewriting hmm. and uh, a lot of it was I mean there were, there are a couple of things about about that job. One was that we were chained to our desks. We weren't actually going out and chasing stories, which meant that a lot of think, a lot of pretentious think pieces ended up getting written for those magazines. Hmm. Um, and uh, writing a lot of kind of high flown copy about uh, about photographers, you know. Remember the, and, there were certain writers that liked to, you know, see how many ways they could get the word chiaroscuro into the uh, into the copy. It was deeply pretentious mm. and, and deeply unsatisfying. Yeah. So you fled to uh, Australian Geographic, which you assumed might be a better gig. I, I did, of course, and I certainly thought it would be a um, a better fit with my interests and a mm. and a way of marrying my interest uh, with in in natural history to my writing, but. That was a, a different experience again. Uh, that was my first experience with a um, um, with a publication that had a extremely rigid house style, uh, and it was a quarterly magazine, and everything that was written went through so many layers to get published. Hmm. Uh, it would go from. I mean, I was I was ghostwriting a lot of the time because you were taking copy from. It was it was partially like an adventure magazine, and you would be taking copy from these adventurers, quote unquote, who you know were, were good at kind of having the big idea, and then they'd be asked to write about it for the magazine, but they weren't really writers, so you'd then be ghosting their copy effectively, mm. uh, and sometimes you'd be really making shit up it was as simple as that Mm. Uh, which I found really difficult because there was a certain element of that that felt like lying (laughs) yes you know I remember being told to look up the birds of Kazakhstan or something like that to describe what birds the adventurer might have actually seen there you've got to be kidding me (laughs) Anyway, and then you, then it would go through the editing process, and the edit, the editor in chief was entirely capricious, and no one really wanted what 
really knew what he wanted. So, you know, you'd go through all of these layers and it would end up with him and then he'd send it back and you'd start all over again. And because he had months to fill, that was okay. Mm. But, uh, oh dear, that was awful. I, I lasted for six months and uh, I thought I was a failure. I really did. It had a terrible effect on my confidence. But, you know, I look back at it now, I was like, Jesus, there were there were journalists that won Walkley Awards that walked out of that place after th- three weeks going, stick it, guys. You know? <laughs> I don't want any part of it. Yeah, right. uh, I didn't have that kind of self-confidence at that time. Mm-hmm. So, and at that point you came back to Brisbane, is that correct? That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a bit more about the, the black dog that you mentioned? Was that to do with the self-confidence and the feelings of... Yeah, Australia. yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that was something that had also kind of gone back to gone back to childhood, I guess. So that's something that I've, I've had to deal with on and off, more or less forever. Seems to come around fairly reliably at sort of seven to eight year intervals. Um, but uh, sometimes more frequently, depending on circumstances. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's a battle, and my productivity tends to go up and down with it. Mm. That that first period um, as a professional writer or someone working with words, um, what effect did that have on your productivity at that point? Obviously, you left that job, you came back to Brisbane. Well, Australian Geographic had a dreadful impact on it, upon it because it really ruined my confidence for a long time, and uh, it got to the point where... I was so kind of consumed with self-doubt by that point that for about a year I, I couldn't write a sentence without striking a line through it, mm. you know. I just I thought I was done mm. at that particular time. And the turning point came quite suddenly. Um, I was... Let me think. I was in I was in the city one the centre centre of Brisbane one day and I bumped into a, an old mate of mine who was a lecturer at QUT and he had been at UQ and that was how I'd met him in fact he was uh, doing his masters out there and was lecturing and I was a student in one of his classes anyway I bumped into him and he said come up to QUT for a chat and while he was there he introduced me to um, the head of the creative writing department which was at that stage very new Mm. and this was in the run-up to QUT going from having a traditional arts department to uh, transforming to what they eventually called the faculty of culture of creative industries and uh, you know the creative writing head tapped me to do a lecture on music writing because they had a subject called creative non-fiction and she needed someone to do that. So I was like, okay. And I was going through a terribly difficult time at that point. I'd actually spent a couple of weeks in hospital for the first time. And so I was really not in good shape and not in good shape at all to be delivering a lecture to anybody, frankly. But mm. somehow I was able to Somehow I was able to do it with the assistance I might add of medication, which <laughs> which I hadn't been on before and actually worked. And uh, and I was able to crank out something like eight thousand words for a two-hour lecture. Believe it or not, a two-hour lecture on on music writing wow. to about one hundred and twenty people. Hmm. And for about the first, I don't know, eight to ten minutes of this lecture, I was so nervous that I couldn't look up and eventually I I did look up and and I realized that people were actually with me they (laughs) were actually they weren't taking notes they were actually just really paying attention they were into it and they were laughing at the appropriate moments and and even (laughs) at at moments that uh, that I didn't expect and it was pretty clear that they were enjoying it and Mm -hmm. I started to enjoy it too and realized okay this is a skill I didn't realize that I had Mm. and at the end of it I actually got a entirely unsolicited round of applause which was also you know that was quite gratifying and that was a turning point and and about 
you know, I started to do some tutoring and a couple of a couple of months after that, you know, the the Olympics were starting in Sydney and Savage Garden were playing the closing ceremony. This is an oft told story but worth repeating that uh, seeing Savage Garden play that closing ceremony kind of gave me the spur to pitch an idea that I'd had floating around for a little while without having any kind of solidity behind it about a book about Brisbane's musical history and how it kind of fused with the politics of the place under Bjorki Peterson. Mm. I was a huge fan of The Saints. I discovered them shortly after coming to Brisbane. The first album, I'm Stranded, we're talking about the the, um, the original incarnation of The Saints. I think it came from just sort of seeing the clips on Rage. And I was aware that Savage Garden came from the, you know, the outer boroughs of Brisbane, you know, as the Saints had. The Saints to Savage Garden. Hmm. I was reading a book at that point by Clinton Halen, the Dylan biographer called From the Velvets to the Voidoids about New York punk. From the Velvets to the Voidoids and the Saints to Savage Garden. It kind of had a ring about it and, <laughs> and I thought, I think I'm onto something here. It seemed to kind of put not so much a full stop on the idea of Brisbane as it sort of seemed to take things full circle. And uh, I think the night after that closing ceremony, maybe... I sat down and I sketched out a chapter outline. It was very kind of, it was almost mathematical, mm. you know, right from the start. It had, uh, it was blocked out in six chapter chunks of 70s, 80s, 90s, six chapters each. There was a prologue called Can Know Your Product and there was an epilogue, No, Comma, Your Product <laughs> after the two songs by the Saints. Yeah. And immediately that felt good. That felt like... It was something that there was something real there, and it felt like a it felt like the best idea that I, I'd ever had, and it was, and it's probably still the best idea I've ever had. And if I ever come up with something as good, I'll be very happy. Where were you when you sketched out that chapter outline? I was living at home with my mother. I was not in a good place. Hmm. You watched the closing ceremony with her. Uh no, I believe I was somewhere else, but um. But at, at any rate, that was where I was living at the time. Was it a good performance? I can't recall. Yeah, they were, they were fantastic. And you're thinking, hmm, these boys from Brisbane, they are up there on the world's biggest stage mm-hmm. at the moment. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yep. And there was some, and that sort of, it was oddly symbolic about the changes in Brisbane. Brisbane had transformed in the previous decade since uh, the National Party's fall from power and was developing a a different, you know, more cynical people will still d- deny this, but Brisbane was undeniable... Brisbane undeniably transformed in that decade, in my, in my view. There's a reason why people like Robert Forster and Ed Cooper came back to Brisbane and they both said exactly the same thing. It had a really good energy about it. And uh, there was a sense that it was kind of shrugging off that feel of... that old feel of the big country town that it had and it certainly was shedding the kind of feel of repression and paranoia that it had even when I arrived at the beginning of 1987, which was the last year of Bjorki Peterson. Hmm. So you had the chapter outline Mm -hmm. and the idea of a book. When did you start showing that idea or talking about it to other people? I took it back to Jason Sternberg, the lecturer that I bumped into in the city virtually straight away. I said, look, I've got this idea and I think it might... I'm wondering if you think it might be good as a postgraduate project, you know, as a master's. Mm. And his response was immediate, immediate. He just said, they will eat this up. And... He was right, they did, they loved it, and uh, I was accepted, uh, you know, to do a master's in creative writing at Q2. Actually, it was a Master of Arts, but, um, you know, as I said, it was, the arts department was 
about to call itself the Faculty of Creative Industries. And so that was the stream that I slipped into and spent the next three years writing the book. That must have been validating for you to have that thought and to pitch it and for it to be accepted after mm -hmm. what had just come yep. before. Sure, yeah. But it was still a, a big battle of self-belief to actually get the book done. Um, particularly, you know, once I battled through the first, you know, just r rounding up the interviews was a big thing. And there was a point at which I stalled, I guess, after the first two or three chapters. And there, mu there must have been some times of self-doubt where I was like, I wonder if I'll actually get this thing done but at some point I was able to push through that and it did develop its own momentum as it went because of the enormity of what you had proposed was that kind of maybe what was going on then yeah to cover three decades that's of, right of it was it was history. a huge it was a huge project um and I had kind of one decade covered in terms of having been through it lived through it seen it for myself being the 90s and I to a certain degree the late 80s I'm not you know I have critics that say oh he was in short pants when all of this stuff was going down you know he wasn't there how dare he that kind of thing oh well I think it was one one of those ways in which my slight outsider sensibility coming from Melbourne actually served me rather well having a slightly distanced take on uh, Brisbane of that time yeah and uh, yeah, you know, it, it did develop its own momentum as it went along. I remember um, when I got about, there were a couple of key points as I drove through the book when I got halfway through and two thirds of the way through. I think when I got about two thirds of the way through, when I got, got to the point where, um, where the National Party had been kicked out of office, this was this this was the last chapter of part two I think it was Cyclone Hits Expo I finished that book and I had a incredible feeling wash over me where I realized that I had actually broken the back of it and I knew at that point that I was going to complete that it was a real thing that mm. it was actually going to happen I'd not sh I'd been kind of beavering away for a long time there but that was the point where it felt like I'm actually going to do this that was a huge feeling and I went out and bought myself a bought myself a watch which I still own which is very sentimental to me um, had it on lay-by for a couple of couple of months it was quite an expensive watch um, but that was my little gift to myself a reward to myself for saying well done you've got this you're gonna do it and I did yeah wow and it's important to have those moments as a, an independent writer, I suppose, because you, you don't usually have the infrastructure around you of working in an office. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think, you know, I, I don't mind telling that story. It was, a, it was a really... It was a signature moment of grabbing back a lot of what I felt I'd lost. Mm. Of self-belief, mainly. Mm. That was really important. It is a great watch. It is. It's a, it's a Victorinox. It's not really. It's it's a shame that this is a podcast. We can't show it on show it on air, can we? You know, this is not television. <laughs> so you worked for three years on it as a master's project. Does that mean that you had some funding to complete it? How did that work? I had no funding. No. Oh. Um, so I was entirely under my own steam. So that you know, at this point, I was driving a cab uh, two nights a week, Friday Friday and Saturday night. And at this point, you know, I was living in a house in Red Hill that was right opposite a rehearsal studio called The Foundry. This is just off Windsor Road. And uh, and renting a front room in this very nice Queenslander for $70 a week, you know. The cost of living then was nothing like what it is now. Yeah. And so it was quite possible for me to... Um, you know, work a couple, and and also, you know, the ass hadn't fallen out of the cab industry as it as it would many years later. Mm. So, in fact, there was a, probably a shortage of cabs in Brisbane, if anything. So, it was pop, quite possible to go out there on a Friday and Saturday night, might make quite reasonable money, um, have enough to pay the rent and buy a couple of records, and and uh, you know, all the while I was writing this book. But it was a very kind of hermetic lifestyle at that point. I wasn't... 
going out, I was still kind of, I was quite isolated and this was probably necessary to get the book done. I was driving on the weekends, so I wasn't going out, hanging out, drinking, any of that stuff. I was never a big drinker anyway. Um, and I would be just driving on Friday, Saturday night and writing during the week, also at night, by the way. Hmm. Usually my, my peak writing time at that point was generally between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Oh, wow. Any particular reason? Probably because of driving night shift in the cab, yeah, right. apart from anything else. Would you ever find yourself talking to your passengers about this book idea that you yeah, had? Yeah, I did, yeah. Anything fruitful come from that? Yeah, yeah, well, occasionally. I don't know if you'd say anything fruitful, but occasionally for years afterwards I um, would pick up people and they'd say, I've travelled with you before, you were writing that book. <laughs> Which was quite funny, and and, and occasion, and, and I'd get to say, well, yeah, it actually came out, and and sometimes they, and other times they would recognise me, and they're like, you wrote that book, didn't you? And I'm like, yep, that's me. And they're like, what are you doing driving a cab? And I was like, well, you got me there. <laughs> How did you get into cab driving? Did did you know someone, or did you just apply for a job? Oh well, as I mentioned before, at that at that particular time, you know, after coming back from Sydney and and. Uh, not being in a particularly great space, I was living with my mum, and so I needed to, um, you know, at some point I needed to earn a living again, since I wasn't doing much, if any, writing. Um, and that was another ad in the paper, basically, and I was like, hey, I like driving, I like people, how bad can it be? And my standing joke is that um, after 15 years of doing it, I still like driving, I don't like people quite so much. <laughs> Jesus. Um do you want to get into that now, or shall we continue with the chronological kind of? Uh, oh, it would probably lead us to lead us down. Um, you know, let, maybe we should avoid those thorny thickets for the time being okay. and concentrate on the writing. Sure. Well, you got into the final stretch of the book. Did you have mm. a title at that point? Did you know what it would be called? When I first hatched the idea of the book, actually, it was originally called Security City. Hmm which was, uh, again, you know, a, a cop from the Saints, um, Security City being Brisbane, uh, a song on their third album, Prehistoric Sounds. But I was very... Uh, at some point, it's it hit me that Pig City, which was a song by an all-but-unknown band called The Parameters, um, when I say all-but-unknown, I mean certainly outside of Brisbane, and I did not want to write a parochial book that would only be read by people in Brisbane. I wanted to write a book that would uh, be explicable and and resonate with a national audience, not, not just from people in Brisbane. Hmm. But despite the fact that the parameters were all but unknown, Pig City was just simply a much punchier title. And its lyric did uh, stand for a particular time in Brisbane and was hugely symbolic. It was the only lyric from from a song that I quoted in full in the book, and the time that that song came out meant that it fell smack bang in the middle of the book's narrative around about the time of Cloudland's demolition, which was really the symbolic kind of bottoming out point for Brisbane, mm. and also the time when the National Party was elected in its own right without needing the, the Liberal Party to govern with in coalition. Uh, so that was really almost the fulcrum of the narrative. And as I said, Pig City was just a much stronger, punchier title. Mm-hmm. How much of the political history did you already know when you sketched out that chapter outline? How much of it was new to you as you did the research? No, I was... I was pretty across most of it. I knew that I knew the key points, the key moments in history that needed to be in there. Um, not to wish, not to appear defensive, but a lot of the criticism that came in that book's wake came from people who felt that I'd overlooked or underplayed in some way the music that came out of Brisbane in the in the late eighties, particularly. Um, and my response to that has always been that the book was not an encyclopedia of Brisbane music for the same reason I just mentioned. It was not meant to be a parochial book. It was meant to be a story about the city, and so I was quite happy to 
overlook, you know, you know, there were bands that I loved that I overlooked, but I had to write about the Fitzgerald Inquiry. I had to write about the fall of Joe. I had to write about, you know, uh, the raid on Rocking Horse Records. It was actually really interesting to me how uh, key moments in the city's political history seem to fuse with key moments in its cultural and musical history as well. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons why I felt like there was something about Brisbane that was unique and something about the idea that just sort of seemed to work. It's really interesting to hear that you had that national audience focus in mind from the beginning because as you said it could have been very insular and Mm. have had very little relevance to anyone outside of the city but for you to realise this is a story that people outside of Brisbane will want to know therefore I'm going to tell it in a, a widescreen sort of sense. Yeah and there was a huge irony a, 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 and a continuing irony that the book was, I think, although it initially would have sold the most copies in Brisbane for obvious reasons and probably still does, the best reception that it got critically was in Melbourne. Uh, and the rev- you know it was shortlisted by the Age for their book of the year. The best reviews by far came out of came out of Melbourne, and they seemed to understand, you know, the purpose of the book and the idea of the book rather better than than it ever was in Brisbane where it was not surprisingly received more parochially and I think people in Brisbane were a bit too close to it again I think this is where me coming from Melbourne initially was perhaps in some ways an advantage now that irony continues to resonate almost all of my freelance journalism as of as you know is not published in Queensland. <laughs> uh, it, can, I, it, it was a couple of years after Pig City's publication and the year after it was shortlisted by The Age for their Book of the Year Award that I was that an opportunity came up to write about the... This brings us back to the Brisbane Lions, that I was invited to write about AFL footy for them and I was able to bring my, you know, Melbourne, Melbourne boy love of AFL and I was suddenly able to write about that. Worth mentioning too that uh, that writing about AFL was also a, a breakthrough for me because I had been quite the stone cutter before that, you know, having perfectionistic tendencies and stone uh, a, a stone cutter. I've never like, heard that. Oh, like chiseling out words, you know. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so it would take me it'll take me a long time to do stuff, and it was all <laughs> part of this kind of you know in a in a battle for self-belief mm. in my writing uh, and when uh, the the story of getting asked to write about footy for the age is kind of interesting too um, I'd been and this is where you know the various interests in in my life are in probably sharpest relief I was I uh, a research assistant aboard the Aurora Australis, the uh, Antarctic flagship, <laughs> what? which I'd done twice. I've travelled to Antarctica twice Jesus. in the summer of 2004, 2005, and again in 2005, 2006, yeah. counting seabirds, which had become a special, you know, special interest of mine uh, for a, a long-running, longitudinal wildlife survey. And it was on the second of those voyages in 2005, 2006, I got a four-word email from John Harms, the great sports writer, Melbourne-based, and it just said, when are you back? That was it. And I, go, I sent back an email giving him a date. And why? And he said, well, there's a gig going at The Age covering the Brisbane Lions if you're up for it. If you are, I'll pass on your details. I was like, okay. And then... The next day I, I had an email from the sports editor at The Age, Warwick Green, asking if I could take this gig on that I'd been recommended. For the first time in my life, you see, I had a recommendation. Yeah. I had connections that I didn't have when I was starting out 10 years previously or 15 years previously. Mm. And uh, Warwick Green's email said, are you confident that you'd be able to turn around the copy quickly? And by that I mean very quickly because it meant writing match reports and filing on the siren 
or five minutes after the final siren. So you're writing what's called go last copy as you went. You would be you would be writing as the match was unfolding and then topping and tailing it at the end. Wow. It's a skill. And yeah. it's a skill that I had to learn and it terrified me because I'd never written like that before, but I was like, I might never get another opportunity like this again. If I don't I'd be crazy not to take it. So I did. I thought I can only try. And uh and it worked. And I remember the first, after the first two or three times I'd done it, and I could see, I could read the copy, you know, online. And then, you know, if I could get it in the physical paper, you could still get it, hmm. of course, at, at, at that time. And I would see the words on the page, and I was like, well, there might have been a, a few kind of errors that slipped past the subs because they always did when all the matches are played at night so you'd be filing for second edition and uh, and everything got pushed through at the last minute so inevitably there were some errors that would creep through but it dawned on me that the copy was okay that it actually made sense and you know it was colourfully written and you know I wasn't I certainly wasn't embarrassed to have my name next to it <laughs> And by the next day, it was literally fish and chip wrappings anyway. Yeah. It occurred to me that not to sweat the small stuff quite so much. Nothing d- dates quite so fast as a, a match report for a sports game. It's, That's re- right. it's relevant the day after and never again. Exactly, exactly. And that was kind of a powerful thing for me. It, 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 after years of kind of really being... A stone cutter. A stone cutter and being <laughs> unsure of myself... Yeah. It was like, well, well, yeah, okay, I can do this. And I was writing, you know, I finally had achieved a dream of sorts. I was writing for a national broadsheet along, alongside people I hugely admired. And, and they and asked you to, to join. They asked me to join, and and 11 years later, I'm still doing it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's something I'm proud of. Uh, it's a shame that I never got the full-time gig and that this was at the point of course where the bottom started to fall out from newspapers just as it surely would from cabs years later (laughs) i uh, specialize it seems in working in industries that have been disrupted by technology (laughs) you know Uh, how to pick them yeah i do and i've never kind of grabbed the brass ring so to speak but you know it's one of the ways in which i've been able to eke out a living well, let's go back to Pig City. At what point did you have a book deal in hand for that project? Surprisingly early, because... Uh, and again, this is where the timing of that book was just remarkable, really. I mean, there are a lot of things... This is... I was particularly lucky at that partic- at that point in my career. Um, originally, I actually pitched the idea I had a couple of chapters and I pitched it to text publishing in Melbourne which was probably the best publisher of non-fiction in the country at the time they had Gideon Hayes book books on cricket which I loved um, and I got a rejection notice from uh, Melanie Ostell who said that it was uh, fanzine journalism mm-hmm. I don't think she'd actually read what I what I'd sent her honestly uh, and that made me very determined to prove her wrong. <laughs> and I then pitched it to UQP, which was, you know, obviously a more natural home for a, a book that was set in Brisbane, really. And a couple of things that... Well, actually, I can't remember who the editor was, but... Probably could if I thought about it, but at, at any rate, she was Peter Carey's editor, and Peter Carey was still with UQP at that time. They were quite interested, but I was more or less, you know, I was pretty much in the wilderness at that point as a journalist, and 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 it certainly, you know, I hadn't written a book before, so I got a message back saying that they were interested, but they wanted to see more, which was entirely fair enough. Then. Two things happened. The first was that that editor and Peter Carey both decamped to Random House, and there was a. Re- the second was that there was a restructure underway, 
at UQP who, uh, you know, obviously the editor needed to be replaced and Madonna Duffy came in and she had a brief to find new talent. And she had another look at it and she signed me up on the strength of the first couple of chapters that I'd written and and the outline. Uh, And I think she just had a hunch. So Pig City was the first title that she actually signed up and I was the first new author that she signed up so I owe Madonna Duffy a great deal almost everything (laughs) and from there were you sending in chapters as you finished them or did you wait until you had big chunks to send over to UQP I'd sent over I sent over each chapter as as they were completed Um, one by one simple as that then you got to the end, you had it all there, including the intro and outro, prologue, mm-hmm. epilogue, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the editorial process like and, and how... Pretty simple. How, um, how much had you nailed what you had originally proposed in that first uh, draft? I, th- I think... I mean, I might... At the time, I was too close to it and, uh, you know, I was pretty pretty shattered by the end of the process. But when I look back at it, I think I actually did nail it pretty well um i mean that chapter outline didn't actually change that much Mm. between that night watching or the night after watching savage garden play and the end there was a little bit of movement in the in the middle sections but pretty much the the chapter outline and the titles that i proposed for them were pretty much as they were from the beginning um and uh you know it took a while to get enough distance from the book to to have a sense of object, any sense of objectivity about it, but um, I was tremendously proud of it. You know, after I mean, I, I again, I have to qualify that in saying it took about a year. It probably took until it being nominated for the Ages Book of the Year award, and and then getting pressed into a its first reprint. Mm. And when that happened, I read over it again. I was able to kind of make a whole bunch of changes to you know the typos that had crept in and stuff like that but when i did that i was able i had a bit enough distance on it to say actually this is pretty good i'm pretty happy with this it took it took a year but I, <laughs> but eventually i was able to uh you know eventually i had enough distance upon it to appreciate it now i, I look back on it and i mean i haven't obviously reread it for a long time you know, I don't need to really do that anymore. But it feels like the work of a different person. Hmm. Um, and uh, well, I guess I was back then. And the book had a tenth anniversary re-release. Was it twenty fourteen? Is that right? Twenty fifteen. Uh, twenty fourteen. Yes. yes it was. came out two thousand four, and then the tenth anniversary. That's right. And you you wrote a new introduction. Yes. To kind of. Um, some That's s- right. Which became instantly redundant, or at least redundant far sooner than we might have thought, because at that stage Campbell Newman was premier, and he'd been elected with such a whopping majority that most people assumed that he was going to be in power for at least another ten years, possibly twenty years. Um, of course, that's not how it worked out. He uh, alienated so many people so quickly that he ended up being turfed out uh, after a single term and, in fact, only six months after that 10th anniversary came out. So this so um, this scabrous new introduction that I'd written was obsolete within six months. It's the terrible thing about writing non-fiction. I, I wanted to write that write that 10th anniversary in such a way that I wouldn't really need to meddle with it again, wouldn't need to write another introduction for a long time, if ever. But uh, <laughs> Reality intervened. Reality intervened again, as it always does. Can we go back to that um, Antarctic um, sure. seabird counting thing? Was, yeah. that a, did you, was that anything you ever wrote about? Because I can't recall... No, it wasn't. I never did. Which is, in, in one sense, rather regrettable. It sounds um, amazing. Oh, it was, it was marvellous, but I think I wanted to be able to enjoy an experience like that without feeling like I had to document it. Turn it into material. That's yes, right, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to... 
allow expression to that other side of myself, the bird watching side of myself, the wildlife loving side of myself without needing to fuse it with writing at that point. I, mean, I was pretty cooked after writing Pig City anyway. I didn't want to turn that into a book. I wish I'd turned it into a longer feature article, but you know, I guess that didn't happen. You have to go back for a third time. Is it is the opportunity is the door still open for that type of thing? No, that that particular wildlife survey uh, came to an end a, a few years later. Was there anything to do with the CSIRO? Or was that an independent body who did? Uh, no, it wasn't the CSIRO. That the project was run out of uh, the University of Tasmania. It was in regards to long lining and albatrosses uh, so for your readers who aren't aware which I'd imagine would be most of them uh, there have been catastrophic declines in seabird numbers particularly larger seabirds like albatrosses and the larger petrels because they get uh, drowned uh, on long line hooks hmm. so long liners are, are baited with bait, baited with fish for bigger fish, uh, they're trying to catch tuna, and they're trolled out behind behind ships for you know a kilometre or two, and albatrosses will literally dive on the bait, take the bait just like fish will. Mm. The hook will become embedded in their bill, and they are then dragged through the water and drowned. Wow, and uh, but those declines need to be documented and that survey went for I think 25 years and you've got to be able to you know to affect change you needed to be able to show the data to to governments globally and so that was what that survey was about it was about actually charting the rate of decline in uh, in bird numbers hmm. so that was what that was part of were you manually recording this on pen yeah, and paper? Or uh, not no, some onto kind of counting on, onto comp onto computer. Yes. We had basically a spreadsheet, and we were recording we were recording bird numbers of all species, and also um, incidentally seals and whales, also hmm. now the wildlife. How long were you on board at a time? Uh, eight weeks for the first trip, ten weeks for the second. Wow. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like to be on a ship for eight weeks. Uh that cabin, f that phrase "cabin fever" exists for a reason. <laughs> but it was a marvelous experience. Yeah. Hmm. Before I forget, there's a massive poster just in front of me, just over your shoulder, as we sit here talking. Um, mm -hmm. It's an extension of Pig City mm -hmm. we were just talking about. Um, tell me about this poster and what it signifies. Okay. Well, uh, three years after the book came out, in fact, it would would have been less than that. It, would have been the beginning of 2006 so two years after the book came out I got a call from uh, from someone at Queensland Music Festival which was something that I'd never paid any attention to previously Queensland Music Festival was quite a highbrow sort of event it was more adult contemporary very stuff. adult contemporary more interested in classical than anything and she talked to me about the idea of turning Pig City into some kind of music festival and to be honest I didn't take it at all seriously. Mm -hmm. I heard later that she got off the phone and said, well you didn't sound very excited about it. <laughs> and it was true. I, I, I was like, yeah right. I got, kind of got off the phone and I was like, yeah right. I honestly didn't believe you know, what she had in mind. I didn't take it seriously. Um, I think someone had tried to get something similar happening under another name and it, and it had not flown. It got canned, in fact, at the last minute. It wasn't until later that I thought, you know, this is how naive I was. I kind of thought, hang on, Queensland Music Festival, that's kind of, that's government funded. <laughs> they actually did have resources to draw upon mm. to make this happen if they wanted to. Um, Paul Grabowski was the incoming artistic director of the festival at that point, and um, eventually, though, you know, I, I kind of wised up that this was 
a fairly serious proposition and I went in to have a meeting with with Paul and others from QMF and started to talk about the idea of of a music festival based on the idea of Pig City getting as many of the bands as possible from that era to reform. It, it's uh, I can't remember how the idea had come up within the offices, but at some point someone had said, well, really, you know, check out this book. Let's let's do this properly. And they, they got in touch with me and, you know, credit to them for doing entirely the right thing. They wanted to do something that was that was based upon the concept of the book and a, a kind of celebration of Brisbane's musical journey. Mm. And... Uh, and then Grant McLennan died from the Gober Twins. And that was very, you know, apart from the immediate tragedy of it, um, which affected everybody deeply, I just thought, well, that's that. Because they were the obvious headliner. And if anyone was going to do it, they, I thought they would. Because you they know. were active at that point. They, they were not only active at that point, but about three weeks before Grant died, I'd bumped into him at um, at a record shop in West End and we ended up having lunch. And it had come, out of that meeting had, had come uh, the news that, that the book had been shared around the, the tour van on the band's last sojourn through Europe, which was immensely flattering, of yeah. course. And uh, I thought that they, I thought that they would probably do it, and I, I, I had been asked by Paul, you know, what chance do you think we have of getting the Saints to reform the original Saints? And I think I replied, Buckley's and none. Oh, I thought their best chance was getting Ed Cooper to do the Aints, which was his vehicle of of doing Saints material without Chris Bailey. Uh, and not long after Grant's passing, I think Paul rang me up again or, or emailed me again and said, we are doubly determined now to make this happen. Wow. And they went back to Ed and Chris from the Saints, who were, of course, always at, at really, if not at war with one another, then, you know, there was a huge bridge a, a big divide between them in terms of getting them to play again it was always a very difficult prospect but Grant's death I think did end up being some kind of a spur for them to do it mm. I, I think the pitch was made that you know this is a legacy and a history and you might not get you know it might be difficult between you two, but I, I don't know if I'm speaking out of, of turn here because obviously I can't speak for for Ed and Chris, but I think that there was some spur for them to, to reform after what happened with Grant. I think that was part of the glue that made them decide to do it again. Mm -hmm. And of course, when that was confirmed, that was massive. You know, it was the first time the Saints had played together in their near as damn it original incarnation with Chris and Ed and Ivor Hay, the drummer, in 29 years. Um, and their first, their first concert together ended up happening just down the road from where we're sitting in my home in St. Lucia, you know, mm. a kilometre away at the University of Queensland where they played some of their earliest and in fact most notorious gigs. <laughs> Uh, a recording was made of the show, which I have, which came out on shock and which I ended up writing liner notes for. And there's a moment before they start playing No Time, which is the B-side for I'm Stranded, where Chris says in his best Oscar Wilde from Anala voice, <laughs> well, this is fortuitous. The last time we played this song here, we got kicked out. <laughs> and... And into it they launched, and uh, there was also, um, you know, Chris went into this extended kind of rave before introducing I'm Stranded, where he, he drops the name of the book Pig City. So, of course, this was a, an immensely proud moment for me.
but mm. uh, the main thing I remember from the day itself when it finally came around you know under this big top which was had 5,000 people jammed in there um, I was determined to enjoy the day p- purely as a punter I didn't go backstage until the very end of proceedings mm. I think um, and I so I spent I spent the day in enjoying it as I would any other show basically down the front <laughs> and uh, I remember them you know playing swing for the swing for the crime from prehistoric sounds one of the big things that had another thing that had been crucial to them reforming was that they'd never had the chance to tour prehistoric sounds which is arguably their greatest record and that record has a horn section Paul Grabowski being a jazz man had said we'll get you a horn section so you, you can do justice to this mm. material and that was a big thing yeah and when the you know when it reaches the point of the horn solo in in uh, swing for the crime uh I, I remember just i had tears streaming down my cheeks at that point it was massive and uh yeah yeah I was there and funnily enough that was one of my first assignments as a music journalist really to review that gig for that. Faster Louder yeah right yeah so I wonder if that's still online I'll look it up I think it might be I'll uh, include it in the show notes but yeah I, I started writing about music in June 2007 and the festival was in mid July 2007 Yep, just July July fourteen two thousand and seven. And I'm not sure if um, this was before or after the festival, but um, I met you for the first time on a Brisbane City bus, ah. going from St Lucia to Toowong, okay. I think to the pub with some mates. And I must have just read Pig City around that time. <clears throat> My older brother Stuart gave it to me and said, "Read this, you'll learn a few things." And of course, I did. And um, I saw you on a bus, and as I was getting off, I stopped you. I had long dreadlocks at that point. And, I said, um, you know, hi, Andrew, um, love your work, mm. kind of keep it up, something like that, shook your hand, and I think that was it, and you were probably like, who the fuck is this guy, you know? <laughs> getting accosted by fans on a Brisbane City bus, but um, yeah, that's where I first met you, and one of my first assignments was the festival that had your book's name. Yeah, well, that's, uh, like some people get their books made into films, and certainly it would have been far more lucrative for me as a writer if, if that had happened. It has been optioned, by the way, but it's never been fulfilled, which is the way of these things. Um, but getting the... Not so many people get their get their book turned into a rock festival with their heroes headlining. That's something I'll be able to go to the grave uh, and uh, be very happy about. In fact, uh, John Birmingham put it very well in a piece about the festival that he did before it happened. He, he said... Uh, Amazon lists 100 books about Woodstock, but uh, to my knowledge, not one of them was written before the event actually happened. (laughs) And to draw a link to the present day, there is another incarnation of Pig City, which is just about to begin, or maybe has begun. This will come out mid-October, something like that. I'm sorry, what are we talking about? Something to do with a little record label. Oh, of course, yes. Pardon, <laughs> pardon, uh, pardon my leaky brain, but yes. So, uh, look, I, a friend, a friend, and, and I hatched the idea of a record label that was purely Brisbane-based, Brisbane artists, and it just made sense to call it Pig City Records. Of course, um, it was a way of. Uh, leveraging some of the some of the legacy of that the book has, I'm proud to say, left, and a way of giving something back to the community of which I love, the music community, and have been part of, and have been accepted within, and feels like home to me. And for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, I haven't been able to finish another book. Um, well, you know, whether or not it ever happens that I do, I think I'm still able to do something like this. And, you know, we've actually just got back the first test pressing of our first record that comes out by a band called Some Jerks. 
uh, that will be launched on October 28 at Black Bear Lodge. And uh, uh, I was up at Mount Glorious yesterday listening to the final mixes for our second record by an artist called Sabrina Laurie, who's one of the most talented people I've ever met in my life. So, you know, it's certainly costing us some money. I'm hoping we don't lo- lose too much. I'm hoping we don't lose any of all, <laughs> any at all, of course. It's a risky endeavour, particularly when, uh, you know, to bring us back to the start of this conversation, particularly when I'm not quite sure how my rent's getting paid in the next few weeks. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, if we never do anything better than these first two records, you know, I'm immensely proud to be putting them out. Well, you did mention not too long ago that you like um, jumping into industries just as they're being disrupted or have been disrupted. Well, you know, we're a, we're a vinyl-only label, basically, and the model's very simple and very low risk. We uh, effectively are sinking the money into uh, into simply getting these records manufactured. And, uh, and, you know, we're only doing a few hundred copies at a time, which really means when you're selling them at about $30 a pop, you've got to sell roughly 120 or 130 records to make your money back. Well, I'm pretty confident that we can sell 120, 130 of of these records and then roll that into the next one. So, um, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a risk. But uh, one thing that actually hasn't died and, in fact, is making something of a comeback is, is vinyl. Um, Obviously, we're not talking big numbers. We're talking boot. We're absolutely talking boutique numbers. But we think there's enough interest in these artists, even just within Brisbane. There is enough parochial interest to uh, make sure that these records will at least make their money back. And uh, you know, hopefully, we can be a platform to to get these artists in front of people nationally as well. Yes, you see, so you had Pig City, the book, festival, record label, it's almost That's like right. a franchise, like a series of things. Yeah. What comes next? Uh, musically or writing-wise? I mean, I mean, Pig City-wise, have you got like a restaurant chain line? No, <laughs> no, no <laughs> I think pork products. I think this is about as far as we can probably <laughs> we can probably take it. I, you know, but um, but that's good because it's a way of you know I won't I, I'd be very surprised if I got anything back out of back out of this financially it's a it's a financial risk more than anything um but it's but it's a way of uh keeping the name alive and uh and also as i said before you know giving something back to to that community i do believe in that very strongly there's there's a a moment in high fidelity Nick Hornby's book, later, of course, a film, and I actually think the film in this instance was actually superior to the book. So if you think of the film, which, you know, where the character Rob Fleming is played by John Cusack and and uh, his estranged girlfriend, who eventually, of course, he gets back together with, says to him when he starts uh, top five records and... She says to him that, well, finally, you know, you're actually part of something. You're not just a professional critic anymore. <laughs> you're actually um, embedded within uh, embedded within that music community, and now you're you're part of it. You're right. not an outsider anymore. You have had some previous experience in this field, though. Um, you have a fairly long-standing relationship with the band Hits. Mm-hmm. And a few years ago, you went to Europe on tour with them, mm-hmm. and you wrote something, or you had designs on writing something about that experience. Do you I want did, to talk yeah. A bit about that. Yeah, look, it, it's a shame that that book didn't. That was another book that didn't get completed. There's been a couple for various reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I. I had an idea that this book would be kind of a cross between this is Spinal Tap and Withnall and I, which is a wonderful concept, really. But um, I think the longer the tour went, the harder it became. As I was the driver of the band, I was that was my job. I was hits is effectively a hits is hits a h i t s all caps. Um, they're a Brisbane rock band who I absolutely adore. Um, 
and I became, you know, the kind of chief booster <laughs> more than anything, um, and became their road manager through Europe. Not their tour manager, but you know, I was driving them, doing their merch, and uh, really. I've always said my role in that tour was being the straight man in the comedy act. You know, they needed someone to kind of keep them more or less grounded to, and to get them safely from A to B. I, I remember Richard Richard Hunt, the singer, coming up to me before a fairly catastrophic gig in, in Lyon in uh, eastern France and saying to me in his best sort of Neil from the Young Ones voice, we couldn't have done this without you, Andrew. You're a stabilising influence. <laughs> I think that was actually true. I think they'd still say that that was probably true. Um, they they probably needed me uh, at that time in a way that they don't now. They've actually just been back to France and played four nights in a row at the Binnick Festival there to a huge number of people and just killed it. And they didn't need me this time, you know, that... Uh, and and I'm really proud of the small role that I played, uh, the contribution that I made to that band. It might not have might not have got written as a book. It might have made a better feature article. But um, but I think if I did do anything for them at the time, apart from just the practical contribution, it was helping give them the, the belief that they were they were really good enough to do that. And uh, you know, we're playing mostly to small audiences, but they made lifelong friends, and those friends were critical to getting them back and playing in front of the audiences that they've just played in front of. My God, the photos and video from that tour they've just done are, are unbelievable. And although I wasn't there much as I would have loved to have been, I've never been so proud of them. Hmm. And of course, it was a feature article. It became a it became a feature yeah. article, yeah, for uh, for the Courier Mail. Kiwi cans. Maybe maybe one day I could uh, finish off that book. I might have to. There might be an element of uh, fictionalising though to get it done. <laughs> well, you had a, quite a few um, great feature articles in the last few years in Kiwi cans uh, um, under Matt Condon primarily, mm, yeah. who was a, 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 a friend and supporter. Only of Only a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we get to where you're at now, the last time I was here at your home was under less happy circumstances I suppose you weren't here and you were in fact missing um, right and yep. I drove over here on around midnight on a weeknight to meet your partner and um, see if we could glean anything about where you had gone and why you had gone do you want to talk a bit about that I think uh, I don't want to talk about why I'd gone um, that was a mental health crisis and you know that's really between me and my partner who I'm no longer with um, and of course my my doctors um, so you know that was obviously a you know a terrifying ordeal for everybody concerned yeah. including me uh, and things you know that I think the point that is worth worth making about that episode from a point of view of this podcast uh, is that it got me thinking, in the aftermath, it got me thinking deeply about how we talk about mental health in the media. And I was, I presented a difficult case in terms of reporting for a couple of reasons. One was that I am a relatively public figure. Relatively, I mean, we're talking, you know, I'm well known within certain circles, I think, let's put it that way. And I'm a journalist, and journalists, you know, look out for each other and, and will report on each other. That's the first thing. The second was that I'd set the hairs running with um, a, a couple of tweets that I would not have made if I was not in a state of acute mental crisis. Uh, and I, of course, you know, 
everyone knows that I deleted my social media accounts or deactivated my social media accounts after making them and went off the radar. Well, so, that's where I saw where did I, I, I saw those tweets. I was about okay. to go to bed. I saw the tweets and they distressed me. You obviously distressed. I didn't know what to do, so sure. I came over here. Yeah. Um, I didn't find out until quite a bit later. I mean, I was aware that there was an enormous kind of shitstorm developing about it. Um, but I didn't become aware until later uh, some of the things that, um, you know, the effect that that had on the people closest to me, which is very distressing. I and mean, we had media outside this house you know, um, we had members of the media calling my partner, uh, who I'm no longer with. And she, of course, at the time had no more idea than anybody else if I was dead or alive and she was being harassed for photographs, mm. which is unforgivable, really. And I, be I became aware after the fact that at that point I'd actually effectively cease to be a human being in the eyes of some, I'd, I'd become a story to be got. Hmm. Even among people who I might consider, some of, some of whom are colleagues. Uh, and that was very upsetting. Um, I think that's something that, that's a conversation that we in the media need to have about how we report on these circumstances and uh, need a higher level of awareness that these things don't just impact upon the, the person that might be at the centre of it, they also impact upon the uh, friends and families of, of those around them. Mm. Um, and in, in this case, most particularly my uh, former partner. Uh, so, you know, this is something that, of course, I have to take responsibility for because, you know, I was the person that went missing, but I was also quite literally not in my right mind at the time. Uh, a little bit later on, I was quite disturbed by the uh, story of Duncan Storer. Now, Duncan... Um, of course, was the uh, member of the audience uh, at a Q&A panel where he asked a uh, very simple question of the assistant treasurer, Kelly O'Dwyer, um, that she couldn't satisfactorily answer, and he's, ne and he's never really received an answer. And to me, uh, in fact, I would say that Duncan Storer is the journalist of the year. Hmm. He asked the simple question and the tough question to which he still hasn't got an answer. And for that, he was uh, dragged through the mud by uh, certain members of uh, the Murdoch press. You know, had his, had his family history splashed all over the front pages of the Herald Sun and the Australian for uh, speaking truth to power. Well, I thought that was what journalists did. Mm. I mean, I don't want to claim to be, um, you know, more than I'm not, because as I said before, music journalism, sports journalism is pretty soft. But I thought Duncan did what good journalists actually should do. And uh, for speaking truth to power, he got sat upon by power. Mm. Uh, what was particularly distressing about it was that, of course... Um, you know, Duncan did have history. He was, um, you know, I, I believe he was a survivor of sexual abuse. He'd, he'd certainly had serious mental health challenges. And for asking that question, you know, this very vulnerable member of the community had to be destroyed. Mm. Uh, it was in sharp contrast to how I had been treated, because I don't want to have a whinge or a sook about this. I think mostly my situation as a, a middle-class member of the community 
uh, you know, well educated, a journalist. I, I was mostly my case was mostly treated far more sympathetically, but that does not make what happened right either. You know, I think that's that's a symptom of the class divisions in this country more than anything. Um, but having said that, there were people that overstepped dreadfully as well. I remember um, earlier this year, I was uh, I had I went through a process of fully updating my blog, which meant that I had to search for my own name for some old stories, and that meant that some stories related to my disappearance came up as well, and I cl clicked on one that I hadn't previously seen by the Daily Mail, and the Daily Mail had included screenshots of those tweets that I'd sent out into the world at the top of the story, mm. which was unbelievable. I was like, I ended up emailing the editor and the journalist concerned asking them to please remove that from the from the story because that was just simply not good practice uh, and it was obviously it was distressing to me to see that again but mm. it was more from the point of um, this is where I get back to this is a conversation that we need to have about how we report mental health we don't have uh, anything about this in um, the, co the Code of Ethics, for example. Most media organisations are signed up to what's called Mindframe and their initiatives are about, around suicide reporting, around mental health reporting. Um, in this particular instance, I think, you know, those, those guidelines were ignored. I wanted to write a piece about this myself um, and I would, if I had been doing that, I was prepared to I'm still prepared to actually write about this drawing on what happened to me in my own experience. Um, but I also wanted to talk to, uh, you know, someone from the Mindframe Committee. I would have liked to have spoken to Jeff Kennett from Beyond Blue. I would have liked to have spoken to, um, you know, health editors of other newspapers, for example, um, or Margaret Simons from the Centre for Advanced Journalism in Melbourne, because these are big issues that the media has to grapple with, particularly in terms of uh, reporting on these matters in the age of social media where a couple of tweets can set off a complete firestorm yeah. and stories move much faster under those circumstances than can be readily contained. Um, but I found that editors didn't really want to hear that story reported in that sort of more nuanced way what they did want was the kind of the oprah winfrey confession uh, and you know an op-ed confessional op-ed and uh i didn't really want to do that because that m would make it all about me in a way that i wasn't comfortable with i was hap i was happy to draw upon my own experience in the way that i've done in this conversation uh, but I wanted to do it in a way that was still mindful of my own privacy and still mindful of my ex-partner's privacy, uh, my family's privacy. Uh, but I was prepared to use it in a way that opened up a wider discussion about how we talk about mental health in the media. Yeah, no, that was my next question for you, whether you were thinking about or planning to write about it. And the, the essay or the feature that you just mentioned sounds excellent and timely. And you you... Both. The problem is that no one seems to want it. Well, maybe so, we could talk about that off no. mic, perhaps. But um, yeah, I think you, the fact that you're a great writer who has had this unique experience and can draw on personal experience while also interviewing those experts about how um, it might be better approach next time, I think that would be an excellent story. I'm sure many people would like to read that. Remains to be seen. I haven't been able to sell it previously. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's something that I might have to do for the... Uh, for the Walkley magazine, which uh, curiously does not pay, which uh, gets back into a, another issue that I've uh, talked about at length in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, coming towards the end, Mr Stafford, is there anything that um, we haven't mentioned that you wanted to touch on? Well, probably that uh, very factor, actually, about um, the fight for uh, the fight for journalists to be to be paid for what we what we do. That was a uh, um, Another brush fire that I got embedded in a few years ago, uh, when I had a 
when I was asked to write for Exposure by um, by a startup magazine called The Daily Review, except it wasn't really a startup. It was published uh, by private media, which is very much a, a for-profit company. And uh, if you are if you are a for-profit publication, then it is, uh, I think, ethically beholden upon you to uh, share those profits with the people that uh, underpin your product. It's the fundamental principle of labour. Know your product. Your product Indeed. is words. That's right. That's what you do. You do very well. That's d- and and I, I have to pay the rent like everybody else. Indeed. That brings us more or less full circle back to where we started. It's been great talking to you, Andrew. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you too, Andrew. We did say farewell to each other, but it's now the day after our interview and we are in my home, in my mm. living room, and mm. we have a few more things to say. Um, Andrew, one of your themes of writing in 2016 has been the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. Tell me a bit about that and why that's been important to you. Well, really, it was less about environmental journalism per se and more about um, more about a failing of the local media here, I thought. Um, we have a situation where government scientists from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and from the Australian Institute of Marine Science at James Cook University documented the biggest globe, uh, coral bleaching event in recorded history. There have been only three known incidences of coral bleaching uh, or major incidences that I'm aware of. They were in 1998, 2004, I think, and uh, and this current one this year. And for and and this and the one place where you really wouldn't read about this happening was in the state newspaper, the Courier Mail, and eventually I. Um, took them to task in a piece for the Saturday paper, which in turn was picked up on by Media Watch. Uh, the paper's leadership responded by saying that, firstly, that it wasn't true. They pointed towards stories that had run via news.com.au and AAP, saying that they had in fact covered what was going on. News.com.au and AAP are not run out of the same offices of the Courier Mail. Um, The Barrier Reef, apart from its obvious environmental significance, which surely doesn't need to be spelled out, employs 70,000 people in Queensland. Um, It's a massive story. It it was, you know, we were talking about really an environmental catastrophe on the state's doorstep, wherein, again, according to the same government scientists, 22% of the reef had died, most of it in the northern section, which had previously been the most pristine because it was the least affected by uh, runoff, soil runoff from farms and from land clearance. And uh, that wasn't being covered. And in the Courier Mail. In the Courier Mail. And that, that to me was a monstrous failure of journalism in the state and needed to be called out. It's as simple as that. And I knew that by doing that, it was going to limit my prospects uh, at that newspaper from uh, from that point. But um, it didn't really matter to me that much. Um, I'd probably written less than a dozen pieces for the Courier Mail in the previous 10 years anyway. Um, it's disappointing. It's very frustrating from from a personal point of view in the sense that, you know, I've been living in Queensland for, you know, or in Brisbane for more than 25 years, but um, it makes it difficult for me to write about local issues that are of interest to me uh, in a local publication. But I was prepared to die in a ditch for that issue. Uh, it was... It was that important to me, and I think it was important that that conversation had to be had to be had in media circles. And 
I didn't feel like I had a great deal to lose. It certainly reinforced my sense of being an outsider in uh, in Brisbane and in Queensland as a journalist. But what can you do? Huh. Yeah, your point about um, it affecting your your future chances. It's the kind of thing that freelancers. Um, do have to be careful about because there are so many potential revenue streams in this country for the type of writing that you and I like to do. Mm, Was there yeah. a hesitation before you uh, wrote that initial article or you began calling out the Courier Mail in that fashion? Uh, I actually pitched an idea on what was happening on the Barrier Reef to, to Q Weekend while being aware as I was doing so that it was more than likely to be rejected or not even to be responded to because of the line the Courier Mail had already been running to that point. QWEKEN being the Saturday uh, magazine. The supplement with the Courier Mail, for which I had done some work previously. Yes. And um, being, a colour sup- being a colour supplement and also one of the few uh, places in the newspaper which allowed for uh, any kind of almost long-form journalism... Uh, or lo- longer feature articles was the obvious place to cover it, but it wasn't getting covered. Um, there had been an article, you know, splashed on the front page of the main paper maybe a week before uh, saying David Attenborough's verdict is still the most magical place on earth uh, in the run up to um, Attenborough's, th- I think, three part series on the Barrier Reef. This was a, a dreadful misquoting of Attenborough and a flagrant misquoting, and th- and that was at the point that uh, I th- I kind of snapped, I suppose. It it, aff- it offended me uh, as a journalist as much as anything else, and as I think I said yesterday, I mean, I write about music and I write about sport. Uh, I I do a little bit of environmental journalism. Uh, Music and sport are not exactly... It's not what you'd call hard journalism. But I still believe very strongly that the job of a good newspaper is to speak truth to power. And what I saw was a newspaper that instead was kowtowing to it and would give lip service to science and say that... it. It uh, you know that it should listen to the science. It said so in an editorial, but three days before that same editorial, there were fifty six scientists putting their name to a full page advertisement in that newspaper because they were so frustrated that the story wasn't getting out there and saying that as re- as you were reading, there was a environmental catastrophe unfolding on the reef. Quite an extraordinary. Um step for those scientists absolutely an extraordinary step to take yes Hmm. anything else to say on that matter all right um you and i have known each other as freelance colleagues for some years and throughout that time um one thing that has been a a topic of conversation i suppose has Mm. been um the situation with with your mother and Mm. perhaps how that has affected your writing um would you like to talk a little about that yeah after after um, after Pig City appeared in two thousand and four, um, it started to become apparent that uh, my mother was behaving quite oddly, and it took a few years for my family and myself to realise that something was beyond odd, and actually, you know, something was really quite wrong. And uh, we started to suspect that she had um, some form of early onset dementia, probably, I suppose, by about uh, the year 2007. And at that stage, I was I was recontracted by UQP to write a second book, which I got some way into and uh, did a lot of work on. But unfortunately, it progressively got derailed by by mum's illness, which wasn't eventually formally diagnosed until uh, late 2011 and confirmed mm. confirmed what our fears were, which which was that she was in fact suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Do you want to say and anything qu- about the, the subject of that second book? Or? Uh, oh no, we, that's, uh, uh, I was, it was a book about, another book about Australian music, not, not Brisbane 
but um, mm-hmm. at any rate, you know, the the demands of mum's illness became such that it did knock that project off the rails. Um, and, you know, I suppose if I had... If I had had greater intestinal fortitude at the time maybe that might not have derailed me but it was a it was a obviously a very significant thing to happen I was very close to my mum mm. um, and she was very young to develop the illness she was in her mid-50s when she started showing symptoms of it um, it can actually be traced back to 2002 I discovered a, a letter going through when we um, when we sold her house to uh, fund her um, transition into long-term care, which is now in mm. uh, full-time care, I mean, I went through a box of her personal effects and I found a letter from her um, from her psychologist to her GP. My mum had gone on stress leave from the health department where she was a senior level bureaucrat um, in 2002 and she'd been referred to a psychologist by the department and I found a letter from the psychologist back to her GP which noted that uh, she was experiencing issues with remembering things and with completing tasks that she'd been able to do I was like boom there you go that's it mm-hmm. so that's in mid 2002 we're wow. now in uh, we're now in late 2016 and so that's 14 years which is about average for Alzheimer's disease sufferers. She's towards the end of uh, towards the end of things now, really, and that puts her smack in the averages. You basically seven years from onset to diagnosis, and mm. uh, it's pretty grim. But seven years from diagnosis to passing, generally, um, and yeah, she's in the she's in the end stages of the illness now, and and that um, has obviously been you know an awful thing for the family to go through, and certainly. Uh, for someone, you know, one of the things about freelancing is, you know, trying to find a routine in your day, trying to sort of discipline yourself. You need a lot of self-motivation. And uh, it became very difficult because the nature of mum's illness was very disruptive. You know, you, the, the phone could go off at any, any moment and uh, I'd have to be running over to her place to take care of something something or other and uh, I'd have an asteroid sized crater blown in the day and by the time I got back I was kind of so mentally frazzled it was very hard to focus again yeah so that's uh, that had a pretty big effect on things for a long time and and while I was doing that you know I was increasingly reliant on driving a cab to get by um, which was a steadier form of that was a, and that was yeah exactly that that actually was one thing that was very grounding in fact, and the longer I did it, interestingly enough, um, after years of kind of fighting against it and wishing I was not doing it, I started to kind of accept it and it became sort of embedded as part of my identity in a sense as mm-hmm. much as uh, writing and rock and roll was. I was kind of the rock and roll cabbie, <laughs> you know, driving around town blasting music and uh, occasionally dropping in to see a favourite band uh, in, the in uniform. Of shift. In uniform, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I stage dived in the uniform once, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and and then the bottom started to fall out of that as well, of course, uh, due to the digital disruption. And uh, there was a, you know, there was a very symbolic moment uh, last year. Where Mum went into full time care in February. Uh, we then went into the process of selling her house, and in June, I think, of last year, mid June, we. You know, when the house was sold and, and it was settled, uh, I left the keys to my mother's house on, on the bench, walked out, and I did my last shift in the cab that night and handed over the keys to the cab as mm. well. Wow. So... It's like a door closing on I that. closed two doors at once, yeah. yeah. It was like, I'm done with this. The cab driving was finished at that point too. I mean, I was lucky to take home $100 from a 12-hour shift. Oh, jeez. Yeah. That is distressing yeah. to hear yeah um you wrote about the taxi industry and uber mm, i think yeah. perhaps in your last piece for q weekend yeah it was um did you consider writing much more about taxis or driving well, or? funnily funnily enough i was actually just editing uh editing something that i'd written about that this morning so yes i think there is potential there 
let's put it that way because um, there's, there's there's a lot of stories to, to be told yeah and, and it's and it's and it is actually an interesting time to talk about it because you know the industry has been in such a state of flux and transition and one of the things you said yesterday was you started cab driving because you liked driving and you liked people yes, towards indeed. the end it was only the driving not so much the people yes but <laughs> no no shortage of um interactions with all sorts of people I'm no sure. shortage of no shortage of stories um not all of them bad not all of them bad by any means. There's some. There was some. Uh, there were some good times there as well. But um, mm-hmm. no, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm done with it and glad to shut that door. But, well, but certainly uh, there's there's room for some sto- for some a good story after it. Yes. Something for our listeners to look forward to. More writing from Andrew Stafford. Hope so. Thanks for joining me again, Andrew. It's a pleasure. Thank you. listening to penmanship and thank you to my guest andrew stafford you can find show notes to this episode including links to all the articles we discussed in it at penmanshippodcast.com if you enjoyed this podcast there are a couple of ways you can support it you can share it with people in your life who love reading and talking about great australian writing or you can leave a review on itunes google play stitcher or wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast If you have feedback for me, I'd love to hear from you, andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. You can also find the show on Twitter, at penmanshipau, and on Facebook. The theme song is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. That's it for now. Until next time. (laughs) 